Hi, hello, welcome. This is the interview with Gabrielle, a recently registered architect from Balcoota in South Australia. This clip was used to put together the full-length documentary Behind Closed Doors, The Life of an Architect. If you're thinking of entering the architecture or interior profession, you've got to see it. That link is going to be up above or in the description below to check that out. But without further ado, let's get on with the interview. My name's Gabrielle and I've recently just passed my registration within architecture. I'm one of the graduate kind of area of the designers in the studio. I've always been really interested in not only architecture and kind of particularly interior, a bit of landscape as well. So it's really, from my perspective, it's really important to have that crossover in design to get a holistic overview of what design is. And how long have you been practicing for? I've been out of uni about five years now. So same as Sammy was in the same in the same year, which is cool. Always nice to work with some of your mates. In my final year, I was lucky enough to do some work experience get a role at Hassel and then I stayed on board with them in my final year which was great experience I think I'd temper that by saying anyone that is working in practice it's a bit of a juggle because you've got your focus on your final year studies and particularly final studio um, which is you know important but there's something pretty thrilling about working in a studio and for me it was like almost just forget about your studies and you're like so excited for working on, on real projects so it's a bit of a balance really really great experience and it always helps with your studies as well, so I'd always recommend people to do that, if they can. And why architecture? What made you want to be an architect? Probably similar to a lot of people, I'd always had a passion for creativity and design and art as well going through school. I actually wanted to be a vet when I first started at high school. As I was kind of going through, I kind of reprioritised things, I think, as you kind of go through. And then took a gap year after my final year, not really knowing what I wanted to do, still super interested in design and involved with that kind of outside my um, education and studies. And yeah, came back from a very fun gap year and overseas and realised that's what I wanted to do. And I got pretty much straight into it and didn't really look back. And it's very fortunate that you see your fellow students, not everyone takes to the degree and it doesn't sometimes meet your expectations. Sometimes, I mean, it was fortunate for me that it was, you know, exceeded my expectations and the course, you know, really uh, fostered my love of design and uh, interest in architecture and solidified, yep, this is definitely what I want to do. Mm. Do you have any hobbies outside of architecture? Like if you're yeah. Outside of this, what are you spending your time on? Yeah, I think it's always really important, I think, to have other um, hobbies. Architecture, as anyone that's decided to do it will know, it's pretty all consuming, particularly, you know, with your studies, you're spending so much time, your free time working on, you know, your studio, and then you've also got your uni time as well. And that does somewhat cross over into your professional life. Something that we're all passionate about as designers, you're always involved in it in somewhere in love. So for me, it's like sport, cycling, tennis, it's really, really important too. Hobbies, I think as you get older, it's less so much about all the, you know, many things that you're doing and you kind of focus in on a few things like love gardening, love like hanging out with mates. So it's, yeah, pretty relaxed, no, yeah. Girl, one to 10, how well did your education prepare you for what you're doing now? Um, I'd probably say a nine, only because I think for my year level was, I think the last year level before they brought in the uh, elective internship. For us, it was sort of self-found work experience. It wasn't actually a component. I think for a lot of people that had either found it difficult to locate somewhere, someone that would take them on for longer than a week, because otherwise it has to be paid work, um, found that really difficult and getting your foot in the door is also another thing. So I was fortunate enough that, um, and that's, a, I think, a great thing about the uni hiring people that are working in practice because it allows you to sort of network and meet those people. For me, Adrian was actually one of my tutors in third year and had said to um, our group, if you're ever interested in work experience, come and have a chat. And that's really, really important, you know, seek out your tutors, particularly people that are working in practice and get a bit of a feel for what different practices are like, how you, you know, what you want to work in as well. You're not going to know unless you try. Work experience was invaluable, obviously, to kind of, yeah, getting that foot in the door and also on, leading on to work too. So probably the only thing, I think the rest of the course is really fantastic. Perhaps that, that more practical side of things in terms of preparing you for the working life is you're never really going to know until you do it and it's, it's also hard to really prepare unless you've got that work experience under your belt. What do you think are some of the biggest differences or similarities mm. between studying and working in practice? Oh, there's definitely sim similarities. I mean, the, I don't know why, <laughs> like very naive 
I, I thought, you know, we're coming out of our uh, union. I was like, oh, it's going to be great. It's not going to be all nighters anymore. It's going to be like nine to five. It's going to be awesome. So there's still aspects of, you know, having having late nights, getting projects out, but it's definitely not as consistent as it was. There's always going to be kind of swings and roundabouts as to, you know, project deadlines. And I can say there's more structure in your day. You know, you know, you get to work at a certain time and you typically you finish at a certain time. So you've got weekends, which is just the best <laughs> so not having weekends before so um like most people working um all through your, your uni degree to kind of you know pay for all the stuff you're making and doing at uni so yeah if you could sum up your experiences of architecture school in one word or a sentence or a couple of words mm. words or something what would they be my degree and and my uni can i say what uni i went to yeah <laughs> plug uni sa yeah yeah uni sa awesome awesome course and i think the the variety of um you know different studios and and the subjects that you you work across um going well beyond a few sentences for mm-hmm. for summing it up but uh, um yeah there's a really great level of preparedness that uh, that they facilitate within their course um and that works holistically across a lot of those those courses i just found it so enjoyable like just really dumbing it down it was just really super enjoyable course and you always have those you know stressful moments don't worry you will be fine when you finish (laughs) it's not going to be you look back and you'll be like no that was definitely definitely so easy what am I complaining what are complaining about yeah I think I think it definitely prepares you well for working in the industry meeting you know like-minded people and yeah, that's a good thing sometimes it's a bad thing everyone works as hard as each other meeting great mates through through the course so you know lifelong friends and you know that continues all, all through your your degree opportunities as well i think yeah, there's some really great opportunities that beyond architecture you know through your electives and things like that as well that kind of push the mold and architecture in my mind should always be beyond buildings you should always have different elements that inform your architecture so I did a year of a bachelor of arts before I started architecture and that just faded in miraculously very seamlessly so I was doing anthropology and environmental studies things that you know um, are intrinsic to the way we understand architecture the way we inhabit space and as people as well it's really important it's not just built form it's really important to remember that it's about the people that inhabit these spaces and, and the environment as well. Do you have any morning rituals or routines as soon as you get yeah. to the office or as soon as you wake up or like, do you kind of just get stuck into it? Um, usually it's a bit of a warm up. Like I'm very fortunate that you know, I live relatively close by and so I can ride my bike in and yeah, that's a great way for clearing my head in the morning. I like a lot of a lot of other people in the studio it just sort of sets you up for, you know, you're invis- invigorated for the day, you're not sort of waking up too tired <laughs> most of the time. But yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty, you do usually have your own little ritual, you know, just put stuff down, get get changed or whatever and um, grab a coffee and sit down. Usually it's first thing is just checking emails and catching up on, on things that might have come through in the evening or, you know, you'll be like me and have like 20 sort of checklists around the place of things I need to do or just reminders that I need to to do during the week for me it's pretty relaxed most days it's just sort of how it goes depending on how busy you are you might just you know you're rushing in you're straight on your computer firing up Revit or whatever to jump into what you need to but most days are pretty similar I think yeah and then during the day what do you find yourself working on the most Mostly it's just documentation, I think, and responding to emails. It really depends on the project stage and where a project is sort of situated. So say, for example, it's in the contract admin stage, which meaning it's, it's on site, you know, things are getting built. Depending on your role, you know, you'll be down on site having site meetings. You'll be wandering around site with the, the builder or the client. And so, yeah, sometimes it can be really heavily weighted to that end. I think one of my, my recent projects, you know, was on site, you know, more than three times a week you know checking things off and in that case you're responding to a lot of emails from the builder but then other times you know you're just hitting documentation hard other times you're doing really fun stuff like concept stuff which is awesome lots of ideas lots of conversation lots of collaboration too some of the other things like you might be meeting with suppliers too so there's also external to kind of just like sitting at your desk or being on site you know you might be going out and having meetings with different suppliers or different businesses as well this is kind of networking aspect as well um yeah oh so many things i think 
For me, I would be absolutely just so bored out of my mind, I think, if I was just doing one thing. And architecture lends itself to so many different roles. And I'm sure someone has already said it to you before. It's often said that architects are, are jack of all trades and master of none. Um, I'd say we're probably masters of design in some ways, but... You've got you've got to have a hat for a lot of different roles. It's never kind of dull. I think that's the thing. You're not ever sitting at a desk and knowing exactly what you're going to be doing. It's going to be always changing. Like no two projects are the same. So I think that's what I find really invigorating and enjoying. You have that constant change and interest as well. You might be working on a house which has beautiful kind of bespoke elements to it, or it might be you know a large commercial tower which has a completely different set of requirements and. Uh, you have to get your head around those what you know what the client requires what the tenants require what does the building require to 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 function that constant changing in typology is really invigorating for me that that's what do you enjoy the least then about architecture um it's very much it's a bit of a love-hate relationship where i think for me the passion outweighs the the really crummy parts and and the crummy parts are very small for me the pushes for deadlines and things like that where you've just had a really big week and and you know your mind's just constantly thinking of the things that you need to be doing so um and but then you know that passes and that's always a relief the passion definitely outweighs the bad things and i think that's a good good sign if you feel that the majority of it is awesome fun um then that's what you want. <laughs> exactly. How would you put it on a scale of 10 working mm-hmm. in architecture? I think it's it's such a like a personal question and no two people are going to answer the same. Like if you're not interested in design then you're going to say zero. You know, some people I, you talk to they're like how do you do this? Like it's such a you know can be really demanding in some ways it's quite clicky too so the people that you sort of hang out with are a lot of designers as well because they experience the same things you do they get it whereas you know people outside of the industry perhaps don't have that insight into the intense hours you do in studio or your other subjects to to get through it's high up very high up for me it's not health at all for me but um you know some people looking in might have a different opinion of you know some of the things you know you hear about the industry it's a very fulfilling occupation particularly once a project's finished seeing the positive impact it can have on not only the people using the building but like broader communities it's such a tangible thing to see so i think that's probably the most enjoyable thing for me is seeing that come to life yeah again i'd probably say nine I know, and yeah, there's always, there's, it, it's never going to, I don't think anything in the world is going to be perfect. I don't think you could put it at a 10. There's always room for improvement, always room for changing. There's always those little frustrating things about the job as well that, you know, so it's, it's definitely not perfect, but I don't think you want it to be perfect because then it wouldn't be challenging and then you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that enjoyment out of it. So. Oh, that's my next question. <laughs> what are some of the challenges you face? Probably one of the biggest challenges is that typically outside of the studio, you have to remain really impartial. Impartiality, I think what I mean by that is that as an architect, and this is something you discover when you're going through your registration process, um, if that's something you're, you're wanting to do, you can't be biased towards a particular person you you just have to do your job to the best that you can constantly having to manage expectations it's a really difficult thing so being really clear through emails and and documentation and checking things off is super important to mitigate some of those those issues if you could go back to when you first started yep as your younger self would you have any advice um, oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. I think just worry way less. My degree, I set the standard like way up here when, you know, perhaps I definitely could have come down a little bit further and and that pressure was significant on my own behalf. And that's only through experience. You're only going to know once you've had something so much harder that you're like, what was I even stressed about? And that's that can be a good thing because it reprioritizes your levels of stress and, and, you know, what you can do. Getting those HDs for studio although they seem so important they aren't everything you go into practice and that's obviously you know wanting to maintain or attain a high standard is awesome there's other important things apart from you know those super duper high marks that you 
Words to my younger self, aside from the, the less stress, but I don't know if I could do that. I'm <laughs> you kind of know yourself and yeah. yeah. I think I probably would have tried to get a bit more experience across the board in terms of other practices. You know, my first job was, a, I felt very fortunate and I was able to not, not brag at all, but you know, I was, I was, that was where I was attaining to be. And I was like, I'm going to have to do this small job, small, you know, small practice, small practice and work my way up and was able to kind of jump into that. And, and in some ways that was insanely overwhelming. It was really, and not with, um, you know, any of the people I was working with are all really awesome, but you tend to have a big pond, little fish kind of mentality where you, you're working with people that have been involved in some really amazing projects that you've, you know, you've idolized or you've used in your studio reference work and in in some ways it just can feel a bit threatening I guess and and you know how do I have a voice how can I contribute you know the work that I've done with the uni through tutoring and particularly work experience students it's so important to to know that you have a voice you should always be included in those design conversations you have so much to add no matter what level of experience you have and I think we've had some work experience students um, involved with design critiques and things like that and they've just added a completely different and awesome perspective because once you're working in the industry you tend to lose that fluid kind of I don't want to say fluid creativity so that's definitely still involved but the the focus sort of shifts you're not 100% focused on just creating this awesome beautiful thing that's well designed and functional it's something that works with client budgets and timelines there's so many other constraints that are put into play some of that really like free thinking creativity is somewhat moved into a different kind of realm it's really important to know that no matter what level of experience or skill set you you should always contribute and feel like you are a part of the team um yeah how bloody cool was that? If you haven't checked out the full length film Behind Closed Doors, The Life of an Architect, you've got to set some time aside for that because it's pretty incredible what some of these guys have to share with you, some information and resources that will be really helpful if you're thinking about studying architecture or you just want to get an insight into the profession. So if you want to check that out, you can click that button to the side here or if you just want to go on with the next interview, check that, check out that button to the side there. Catch you there.